It is Wednesday, February the 26th. I'd like to start by thanking the volunteer crew and the Shaw staff. It makes this show happen every couple of weeks. My guest in the first segment is uh, Ben Izzett. Ben is a city councillor and CRD director. And we're going to be talking about uh, the media in our society, I mm -hmm. think. So why don't you just start off with uh, whatever thoughts sure. you may have. Sure. Thanks for having me, Jack. Uh, I think having an independent and critical media is essential to our democracy. And I think when we look historically, when the media has sort of flourished and there's been a diversity of voices, including smaller uh, independent media organizations, that's been very uh, healthy in terms of democratic dialogue and having different viewpoints come forward and having kind of a really engaged and informed citizenry, which is kind of the, the only safeguard against autocracy. Yes. Um, at other times when we see that, that media uh, interest becomes concentrated, uh, the number of voices sort of becomes uh, reduced, you get less diversity in coverage, uh, and then I think you end up with a lot of sort of misunderstanding and, uh, and uh, you can, societies can start moving in very dangerous directions with sort of the most sort of extreme variant being fascism where democracy itself is, is, uh, uh, is removed uh, and you end up with a totalitarian system of government. So I and think... And personally I think we're not that far away from that particular point. Yeah, w in Canadian society today, there still is, is largely a, a respect for, for, for basic civil liberties in terms of we don't see a lot of arbitrary detentions. Uh, we, yes, we but in terms of democracy, <laughs> yeah. I well, don't we, we see much democracy. Well, if, you c if we can compare it to totalitarian societies, I think there, there's, uh, putting my historian and sort of uh, scholarly hat on, I think liberal democracy is, is a road along the way to more, towards more fundamental um, uh, types of democratic participation and you, we don't want to lose the value there. People talk about the legacy of the Enlightenment and it, it's better than what preceded it yes, in terms I talk of the, to people the unilateral all over the world. power of kings to... And they think this is great. But it does, in my opinion it doesn't go far enough. So I think we don't want to dispense with the legacy of the Enlightenment in terms of basic liberties, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, uh, freedom of association, uh, freedom to essentially not have the state arbitrarily and sort of that. Uh, withdraw government your liberty. Of, government of the people. Yes, but I think the, in terms of moving beyond that and attacking things like corporate power yes. and moving towards more of an economic democracy, yes. um, th we still have a long way to go in a Canadian long way society. To go. And the media plays a very big role in all of that and where we are because they sort of control the story. And so I don't know if you want to talk about what's going on right now, mm -hmm. which is... Um, essentially the punching of a corporate pipeline which is poisonous to the planet and to British Columbia through First Nations land who don't want it there mm -hmm. and uh, and the aftermath of that and the media story about that mm -hmm. because it's a, yeah. yeah it's fascinating so the whole controversy surrounding the uh, the rights and title of the Wet'suwet'en people to their territory which is sort of surrounded by um, central northern British Columbia and the Canadian state, but lands that have never been ceded, and uh, land where the Supreme Court of Canada recognized the authority of the Wet'suwet'en hereditary leadership and the At Delgamuk. Least they speak for the First Nations. Yeah, the Delgamuk decision of 1997. Yeah. So we could view it as a parcel of land there where Canadian sovereignty has not been established. And so it does seem problematic for the governments of BC and Canada to issue permits uh, to a pipeline company uh, to build infrastructure where the rights and title holders haven't given their consent. And there does seem to be a disconnect with the government of British Columbia incorporating the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples uh, Act, which incorporated the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of, in of Indigenous Peoples and literally into, British, the next day. into British Columbia law, and well, several months later uh, authorized, yeah, uh, basically police action. And, um, and so there we're seeing right now one of the, the biggest controversies relating to Indigenous rights in Canadian history in recent decades, and that's uh, triggered uh, one of the biggest civil disobedience movements in Canadian history in terms of uh, thousands of people 
uh, blockading government buildings here in the capital city, uh, dozens of rail blockades, uh, I believe the longest disruption to the country's rail system in its history, substantially longer than rail strikes that happened in the 20th century, um, and still ongoing uh, blockades and various forms of action across yeah. the country in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en people. And I think we're seeing a convergence of an indigenous rights movement and a climate justice movement that's sort of coming yeah, together to me, around this issue. Unfortunately, what it's doing is blocking people who should be the allies of this movement mm -hmm. and instead are being uh, uh, pitted against it. But again, I don't mm -hmm. think there was really any need for this. Mm -hmm. You know, the police could have been pulled out very simply. Mm -hmm. That was not a big deal. The police could have been pulled out and the blockades would have come down. Mm -hmm. Um, and there really is no future even for this, uh, for, this, for this pipeline. I mean, LNG, fracked LNG, is not going to be a big market mm. uh, as the world is moving into total climatic instability. I mean, mm -hmm. it's yeah, just the, not... Yeah, the European Union has said they're not going to use uh, natural gas, liquefied natural gas, as a transition fuel. So mm. certainly the business case is dubious. The, I guess the proponents of the pipeline and, and the government, uh, which has issued the permits, as well as for the Kitimat plant, seem to think there is still a business case. So I think that's that difference of view is why sort of the Canadian state is still on the path. I just heard of, today of the that pipeline. the government of Canada is negotiating with Coastal Gas Link, which is owned by Trans Canada Pipelines, to lend them, or probably in the end, give them a billion dollars to pay for the building of the pipeline. Have you heard that? I saw some media reports, but I'm not sure. Yeah. And so definitely there's two very distinct sort of worldviews at play. There's the indigenous perspective and also a number of non-indigenous people who have a strong climate justice and pro-indigenous rights perspective. And then there's, I guess, sort of the petro-capitalist perspective, the sort of high modernist and, approach and of the 20th century. And there's and the, and the environmental perspective, which yes. to me is, is right now is the number one issue. I think a lot of people are supporting the blockades as much for the climate issue as other things. I Some might, yeah, you'd have to ask them. Yeah. But I think the other perspective is this sort of petro-capitalism, which it's coming to a head. And the climate crisis with Greta Thunberg and other young people have reminded us about, it's, you can't argue with physics. And yet the logic of the fossil fuel companies and governments that continue to move in that direction are trying to ignore physics, which is that they're simply, we're putting too much carbon into the atmosphere and it's reaching a tipping point where humans and others, other species won't be able to survive on the planet. And it's, I think, those very different worldviews are what's sort of coming together around this controversy. And there's a number of media organizations that unfortunately appear to be still tied to the fossil fuel lobby, essentially to a dying industry that's killing the planet. But f I think what's really inspiring, I don't see this current controversy as unfortunate, I see it as hugely inspiring with tens of thousands of people uh, engaging in nonviolent civil disobedience, which is one of the noblest traditions in human history, to assert a different worldview, a more sustainable way of living, more sustainable relationships between people, and more sustainable relationships with the ecological systems that sustain human and non-human life. So I think there's a moment of opportunity right now. We don't know which way this will go, uh, but I personally have more hope uh, in the future of Turtle Island, Lekwungen Territory, uh, that, than I have in a long time. Thank you for having me today. Thank you very much, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> and thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. Uh, my guest in this segment is Larry Hanant. And we're going to be talking about the promise and perils of infrastructure blockades, which is what's going on right now. This is being filmed on Wednesday, February the 26th. Uh, we're in the middle of blockades of roads, railway, ports, etc. So the promise and peril of infrastructure blockades. Uh, Larry, what do you think? <laughs> well, the interesting thing is that there's a, a discussion, a, a discussion, a fairly intense discussion amongst kind of strategists about um, about this tactic, about this method, and um, and there certainly are some people. Um, most prominently, I think, uh, sort of, um, uh, uh, Glenn Coulthard is a uh, an indigenous uh, man from um, from Northwest Territories who also teaches at UBC, 
who's arguing that, that this has great promise. It's, it's, he calls it a genius strategy, um, blockades, because with a small number of people, you can force negotiations, those nation-to-nation -nation negotiations that are, have uh, supposedly not occurred, uh, so or not properly occurred. And, um, and so in that sense, with a, a small number of people, you can have a, a devastating impact on the, uh, on the Canadian economy. And the interesting thing is, curiously, that's what some of the media commentators are also saying, and that is that this is, it is uh, eco-extremists who, and it's a small number, of course, always in this scenario, and, and it's uh, sort of people like uh, sort of Jason Kenney in Alberta or, or high-level commentators uh, uh, in the media who are arguing that it's, it's, a, it's a tiny minority. And by implication, the idea is that this doesn't, these people don't speak for you, ordinary folks uh, reading the newspaper, watching the news, sitting at the, the, uh, at the protest in your car, etc. So um, why would you side with them? Why would you sympathize with them? Which While is, ignoring the other story, which is that whether you support or oppose what's going on, your life right now is in mortal danger from the destruction of our planet. And certainly, the next generation is, I, I, I can't even imagine. So that doesn't get mentioned. And instead, we are pitted against each other, as usual. And that's where the peril comes in. The peril comes in, in separating folks who are in danger, because global climate change is a crisis. And, and the other aspects that are, are uh, sort of attached to fossil fuel capitalism are, uh, are equally noxious, the inequality and, and, uh, and things of that kind that are real problems. So, so in a sense, it lets, lets um, people uh, or gulls them into thinking that those other issues are unrelated. And, and of course, they are related. And indeed, the high level, I think it is a high level of support for indigenous uh, sovereignty and indigenous rights, which is so important, that is actually the potential to erode that is, is very real. The way that the, the media commentators in particular and, and demagogic uh, politicians play this issue they uh, are playing it in a way whose intention is basically to split people. So there we see the peril of this strategy, which is that a small number of people can make, uh, cause great disruption. The potential is that you actually separate that uh, sort of uh, demand and those, those uh, so, and activists from the broad supportive population uh, whose basic interests are linked with the, uh, with the, the demands and of the protesters. And it could be that all of this is happening precisely because it's being manipulated by the corporation to create the exact divide that we may be seeing. I don't know that, I, I mean, I don't, don't see evidence of, of manipulation, but, but certainly there's... Look around, <laughs> uh, look around. It's everything, well, isn't I'd everything? I'd be interested in hearing something, but uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, th that is behind the scenes manipulation. But certainly you do see every day, every hour in the, uh, in the media and, and statements from politicians, that kind of argument that is, uh, is using this, uh, this the perilous side of the uh, of the action, uh, and trying to downplay. Uh, downplay well, and right the, here today, the, uh, I don't potential. know if this is actually happening, but there's a blockade of the supposed to be a blockade of the Pat Bay Highway. I don't know if that's actually taking place or not. I haven't heard. Um, but again, so the, it's the, the both sides. Are commuters the the enemy? You know, if that's the case, you've alienated. 80% of the Canadian population, and that's not a, uh, a, a safe place to be. You want to link yourself with those people because, you know, frankly, they're doing what they can to try to survive, even if what they're doing is itself 
problematic. I, I wish there was a way to focus more on the real enemy and blockade them without blockading everybody else. I, I don't, like certainly going after the corporate media would be great. Uh, blockading the media for a little while and, and just saying, how about, how, about a more, how about some truth? Is some truth too much to ask for? You know, can the media say one time that, hey folks, your lives are in danger and we're out of time. Larry, yeah. thank you very much. Great to be here. <laughs> Thanks for watching.